Today we're gonna to talk about PSA density. Now this isn't a super common term in prostate cancer, but it's a very useful term. And today medical oncologist, Dr. Mark Scholz, who's focused solely in prostate cancer for over 30 years, is gonna break down what PSA density is and how you can apply it to your case. In today's video, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about a term called PSA density. Now this is not a common term in prostate cancer for a lot of people. Even when I research prostate cancer, I have to research it specifically. I don't think a lot of people pay attention to it. But it's very important when it comes to staging and when it comes to how PSA acts, it gives us a lot of information about the prostate. So can you explain what PSA density is? Think of PSA density as a step beyond the normal or abnormal PSA of four. People are uh, using PSA in many different roles, staging, uh, monitoring, response to treatment. But when you talk about PSA density, for the most part, not always, but for the most part, we're looking at PSA screening. And that is the policy of checking PSA in healthy people who are trying to make sure if they have prostate cancer that they catch it early at a curable stage. And with all the modern tools at our disposal, I personally believe that if people do PSA screening, it's almost impossible to ever die of prostate cancer because you're gonna catch the disease so early and our treatments are so effective that people can either have their disease cured or controlled for the rest of their lives. PSA density is an enhancement of just saying, hey, the PSA is above four, check it out. The PSA is below four, I'm perfectly fine. You can't really obtain a PSA density unless you have scanned the prostate and developed a sense of how big the gland is. And this whole PSA density thing really is nothing more than a ratio between how big the prostate is and how high the PSA is. If the PSA is elevated but your prostate's big, then your PSA density is still normal. If your PSA is elevated and your prostate is small, then your PSA density is abnormal. And uh, so this is a, a useful way to try and get a deeper understanding of what the PSA is telling you rather than just a, a broad spread population norm of it's above four or it's below four. Before I get to my next question, please click that subscribe button. When you do this, it tells YouTube that this video is helpful for you and they'll push our videos out to other people who are searching for topics like prostate cancer. Also, if you would like to donate and join our cause, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schultz. So when we're talking about scanning the prostate, are we just talking about MRIs or what other forms of imaging would you use? MRI ultrasound. In the old days, skillful doctors could do a digital rectal exam and estimate the size of the prostate. PSA density, uh, although it was developed for accurate uh, prostate cancer screening, so if your PSA density is elevated, that's a justification to move forward with an MRI or in the old days, a biopsy. But it's also helpful in our patients that are monitoring uh, low-grade prostate cancer on an active surveillance protocol because they're getting PSAs on a regular basis. So if the PSA is running on the high side, uh, then it needs to be interpreted in light of how big their prostate gland is. So a somewhat elevated PSA in someone that has a big prostate does not raise the alarm bells that would occur if someone had an elevated PSA with a small prostate. So in a typical situation when it comes to screening for prostate cancer, a man has an elevated PSA typically, he's going to a doctor, and then oftentimes he's really sent to a random needle biopsy right away and then even to surgery or radiation pretty quickly. So where would the MRI fit in? Does a man need to advocate for himself? Because that PSA density seems like it's a good piece of information that fits into this whole scene. Well-performed and accurately read MRIs are an integral part of, pro of modern prostate cancer um, staging and treatment. The uh, information that men get from an MRI is just so useful in so many ways, and I contend in many ways can help men avoid having to get a biopsy at all. Modern MRIs are getting to be so accurate, they are literally more accurate than a random biopsy. And certainly they're a lot less invasive, a lot less uncomfortable. And you get this additional information, of course, about how big the prostate is, which helps you contextualize uh, the PSA. If it is elevated, is it because of a cancer or is it because of a big prostate or sometimes even both? Screening and staging uh, is, for me, the first step in someone that has a suspicious PSA 
uh, to try and determine if there's a consequential prostate cancer present. So is MRI covered, you know, in that situation typically where men have a rising PSA to get an MRI first? I haven't run into difficulties getting MRI uh, insurance coverage for uh, some years now. The, it's quite rare for any pushback from insurance companies. If men have an elevated PSA, it seems to be widely accepted now that getting an MRI is a very reasonable first step. So would PSA density ever play a part in deciding upon a treatment? One way we use, I use PSA density in my day-to-day -day practice is not so much for screening because I have a very low threshold for getting an MRI. There's no radiation, it's covered by insurance, and I don't like to be guessing about whether or not prostate cancer is present. Any time a question comes up of, well, maybe the PSA is a little out of whack, I typically get an MRI, make sure that there's not a cancer present. Men can have significant cancers with normal PSA. So there have been even studies done looking at doing MRIs in people with normal PSA to see how often you can find uh, clinically significant prostate cancer. And they do find, it's not common. But uh, the reason that I, we haven't just moved to doing MRIs and skipping PSA altogether is because thankfully prostate cancers tend to grow slowly and uh, spread slowly. So if, even if you miss it at its very early inception stage, as it gets uh, a little bit bigger and produces a little more PSA, in most cases, you're going to diagnose the prostate cancer while it's still curable. So having a, a PSA as a first step, I think, is a logical and economical way to screen. But uh, uh, using a low threshold to get an MRI uh, and find out what's really going on uh, just makes a lot of sense to me. The question I've gotten oftentimes is patients are wondering if there's a correlation between a large prostate and prostate cancer being more aggressive or there being more prostate cancer over time because the gland is larger and your PSA density is higher. Mm -hmm. Is there any correlation? There's a correlation, but it's actually in the opposite direction. Uh, it turns out that studies indicate that men with bigger prostates actually have fewer problems with prostate cancer. We're not quite sure why that is. Having an enlarged prostate is uh, an issue that's on a totally different track. It's called benign prostatic hypertrophy than the whole issue of prostate cancer and all the complications and questions that are associated with that. So big prostates are good unless, from a cancer point of view, um, they can be problematic in the creation of uh, urinary discomfort, side effects, frequency, and whatnot. But that has nothing to do with the misbehavior of prostate cancer. So in situations where men do have these larger prostates and maybe their PSA is around 10 and they have a 100 cc prostate, does that mean that they, you know, if the MRI comes back clear that it's most likely a BPH situation? Or because it's a, their PSA density is so high, there's other things we need to look at and screen for? Using PSA density uh, on an ongoing basis in my day-to-day -day practice is more in our men who are uh, undergoing active surveillance. And uh, we're doing MRIs once a year to make sure that the little spot of can low-grade cancer isn't growing. And everything seems fine, but the PSA density is elevated. So these men could have other issues because their PSA is running higher than it should based on how big their prostate is. So what are these issues? Well, one is nonspecific prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate that's common. We've pretty much ruled out that it's just a big prostate because we've looked at the size of the gland and we see that the ratio, the ratio is supposed to be less than 0.15 if you divide the PSA into the prostate volume. The third thing is, is this a situation where somehow the cancer has gotten outside the prostate the MRI isn't seeing it, should we be concerned that this person on active surveillance has a more aggressive variant that we're missing? And uh, that uncertainty was always a big problem until uh, the advent of PSMA PET scans, which allows us to scan the whole body and make sure that these men who are running PSA levels higher than what we would expect, uh, probably from prostatitis, but possibly from a cancer that you're missing, uh, now we can uh, get these very accurate uh, scans, PET scans of the whole body, and have greater confidence that we're not missing something that's escaped. So an issue that I've seen pop up a couple times, and I don't know that this is super um, prevalent, but it is an issue I wanted to address, 
is that I've seen men with large prostates come in to these centers and they do get an MRI scan and then they tell them because their prostate's so large, you know, we can't do a targeted biopsy, we're gonna give you a saturated biopsy and we're gonna make sure we check the entire prostate. And for the audience, a saturated biopsy is anywhere between 30, to my knowledge, 30 to 40 needles. So not only are they coming in to get a biopsy period, random needle biopsy, now we're going to the next level of saturated biopsy. Have you seen this happen and what would you tell men who are being told that they absolutely need this? I think the saturation biopsy where not the typical 10 to 12 to 14 needles, which I also believe is not necessary, but again, 20, 30, 40 uh, needle biopsies done oftentimes under general anesthesia, uh, was something that made sense in an era where the MRIs were unreliable. We knew that with the old random biopsies that 20% of the time, the random biopsy would miss something consequential in a, quarter, a corner of the gland, and that just because the biopsy came back favorable, there's still a possibility that cancer was undiagnosed. The saturation biopsy was designed to overcome that. The reason I never recommend saturation biopsies uh, is because the MRIs address that issue. There are uh, naysayers about MRIs who say, well, the MRIs are only 90% accurate. So what about the 10%? We don't want to have anything sneak under the rug and uh, someone be harmed because they, the uh, MRI missed a consequential cancer. Well, if you look at what is missed by a modern MRI read at a state-of-the-art center, it's a, always a tiny, high-grade lesion that could say picked up if someone had a radical prostatectomy, it was missed on the MRI. But it's never been demonstrated that these tiny lesions are dangerous. Uh, I contend that uh, men who have a clear MRI should get another MRI 12 months later, and if a consequential small lesion was missed, it will grow and become detectable over time, and it'll still be caught at a curable stage. Much, much better to have an MRI 12 months later than argue for putting someone in the hospital, giving them general anesthesia, and then harpooning them 20 to 40 times with large bore needles. The relationship between these two alternatives is just glaringly favorable in the idea of just do another MRI in a year to protect against that 10% of men that are missed. We don't even know that those 10% are ever gonna turn into a consequential cancer. The, we know when men die and they do autopsies that Many men have small, consequential, higher-grade tumors that haven't harmed them, and uh, the, I think the right approach is to watch these people, get an MRI once a year, and treat the ones that start to manifest, that you can see can grow on sequential MRIs, and, uh, and don't, don't mess with the other ones. Because you and I have talked about PSMA and this you know, PET imaging that finds prostate cancer specifically, and we talk about it so much on the channel, a lot of people are wondering in the screening process why we're not using PSMA instead of MRIs, and can you even know your PSA density from a PSMA? If we didn't have MRIs, maybe we would be thinking about using PSMA PET scans uh, as a substitute for random biopsies and saturation biopsies. But if you compare the advantages and disadvantages of PSMA versus MRI, MRI actually gets uh, more refined images inside the prostate. PSMA gives you better images of the rest of the body. MRIs don't have any radiation associated with them. PSMA PET scans, you get a, a exposure to radiation, which is uh, manageable if you have to do it. But for a screening test on an annual basis, when you have an MRI that has no radiation at all and shows more refined pictures inside the prostate where you really care, uh, I don't think there's any rationale for doing PSMA PET scans as a screening tool. What about as a substitute for a biopsy? Men do get these MRIs and they may see a shadow, which they, they call it a PIRAD score, ranging from one to five, and the fours and fives typically need to get a targeted, not a random biopsy, but just needles at the spot. PSMA PET scan is a potential alternative to biopsy because it's also about 90% likely to pick up cancer if it's present. So if a man has a PIRADS 4 or 5 lesion on an MRI, but a PSMA PET scan doesn't light up there, he can estimate there's about a 90% chance that that's not a consequential cancer, even though the MRI shows a shadow there and that individual might be able to avoid a biopsy. So there is a place for PSMA PET scans in the earlier elucidation of who needs biopsies and staging and all these sorts of things. But as a routine screening uh, tool, the MRI is a much better tool.
When screening for prostate cancer, the typical system is that men have a rising PSA and then they're usually sent for a random needle biopsy. But if you can get an imaging study ahead of time before the random needle biopsy, ask your doctor about it and say, I would like to know the size of my prostate, whether that's based off an imaging study or the digital rectal exam. And that way you can know how large your prostate is and what your PSA should typically be based off of that. And as we talked about PSA density, this is a really great piece of information to know ahead of time. We are a big believer that you should have a shared decision-making experience with your medical team, which means you educate yourself, you know what your PSA is, you know what it typically does, you know the size of your prostate, you know ahead of time when, it comes in, when you come into those doctor's appointments, and that way you are working with a set of information about you as a particular case, and when you're talking to your doctor, you're just having a more educated experience with him, you're having a better conversation, and oftentimes, time and time again, we have seen that patients who empower themselves with their own history, their own medical information, have greater outcomes, better outcomes over time. Because you're becoming the CEO, you're becoming in charge of your own health. And that's very important. Because when you're in a system, there's a lot of things that, you know, insurance companies or academic systems, there's a lot of things that patients, you know, are in when it comes to prostate cancer. But if you know your own health, your own information, it can help guide you through that process so that you get better care, customized care, and have better outcomes when it comes to prostate cancer treatments down the line. So if you need help with your particular case, you can contact us at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been through this, you know, situation. They've navigated all this before. They've been trained by our medical oncology team, and they can give you information, not advice. But it's a great way to empower yourself before you step into those doctor's appointments so that you can ask him, would this be right for me? Is this not? And that way you get the answers that you need. So I would really encourage you to contact them. Also, if you have topics or questions you would like us to cover in future videos, you can leave it in the comment section below this video and give us, a, give us a thumbs up if you found this video helpful. Please remember most of all, you're not alone and we really appreciate that you watch this channel.